Assalamu alaikum. Good morning, everybody. And uh, thank you, of course, uh, the organizing committee for this uh, wonderful opportunity. Thank you, uh, Dr. Mansour, for the introduction. And uh, thank you all for being here um, to start this early morning with uh, this topic that uh, is very dear to my heart, where uh, our powers combine and we uh, interplay together as dermatologists and rheumatologists. So these are my disclosures for this presentation. So what is interplay? When we say interplay, this is the way uh, in which two or more people or things will affect each other. So together, we will have more, we have a synergistic power. And uh, one person could per perhaps, you know, uh, play a perfect symphony, but with another person, they will together build something that they did not know they were capable of. And where does interplay start? So interplay needs an interface. It needs a place where people gather together, share ideas, and uh, exchange information. And isn't it funny that us dermatologists and rheumatologists, ever since embryogenesis, we are interfacing. So ever since the ectoderm has met with the mesoderm, you will see that rheuma, connective tissue, and derma epidermis are sharing an interface, here being the basement membrane zone. And so this interface is a point where two systems, subjects, or organizations will meet and interact. And of course we will meet and interact. We have uh, the same children, we share the same language, we have our T cells, we have our B cells, and we are talking in interleukins and cytokines all day. What happened? So when physically in the realm of humans, when did this start? So derma is a very ancient science, of course, because most diseases will have some form of skin manifestation. So since even the times of BC, we have Hippocrates describing diseases uh, originating in the skin. And uh, Mercurel had uh, described the texture and discoloration of skin in, the fi in 1530. Whereas Paul Anna discussed and wrote about dermatology per se as the daughter of medicine in 1887. Rheumatology has started around 1940 when Bernard Cambro suggested the term rheumatology. And then in 1949, Hollander wrote a textbook with the term rheumatology in it. And that's where this magic started. So the room derm interface, what is your room derm interface? Think of your organizations. Is it that visit that you have to your colleague, to the offices and asking them about certain cases? Or is it that social media messaging or between you and your colleagues, perhaps in the same organization or even abroad now? Is it societies that are forming now and becoming more energetic and collaborative? or a even educational program that can build rheumatologists with derm and dermatologists with rheum, and then build clinics that have all these uh, powers together, where we can see the cases that share us, our findings and we will come with better outcomes. And of course, such a conference like this one, where we will become uh, sharing all this information together as well. So a little bit of history of how things evolve. So for example, the Rheumatologic Dermatology Society of North America started with a small action in the 1970s when a small group of American dermatologists would have interest in the connective tissue diseases. And so they decided they would go and attend the Rheumatism Association meetings and uh, known as the ACR since 1985. There, they would try to discuss the clinical and research issues of mutual interest to them and uh, rheumatologists. And mind you, this is pre-internet, so you would have to physically go somewhere to discuss things. 
In 2004, there was a lupus erythematosus uh, European Society Conference in Düsseldorf, Germany, and there it inspired the attending American dermatologists to develop similar organizations. So in 2006, the North American Rheumatology Dermatology Society was established with annual meetings in conjunction with the ACR. In 2009, they named it the Rheumatologic Dermatology Society, and those have annual meetings. And this, I believe, would be a great opportunity where we can collaborate. And even in studies, you will see now that dermatologists are interested in communicating with their fellow rheumatologists. For example, in this study done in uh, Saudi Arabia, you will see that 61% of the dermatologists were satisfied with having a combined clinic and 77% of them refer their patients to rheumatologists. And in the case of psoriasis, they actually use screening tools as well. And don't really connective tissue diseases all present with skin anyway, or perhaps this is my derm bias. But I do believe that patients do live with their symptoms of myalgia and arthralgia and head headaches, thinking that they're just aging, thinking that they're getting stressed. And once a rash appears, directly they will go to the clinic. So really, a patient will present saying, my face acts up. But when you dig in, you will realize that they are ignoring their stiffness, their fatigue, and they will not really understand or know that they have elevated ANA or that they have anemia. Perhaps a drop in into your clinic, your employee asks you, what is this rash that I have on my arm? She never really correlated it with the two miscarriages that she had or that she is cold intolerant all the time. A patient comes to you complaining that their hair is frizzy, referred from the primary healthcare physician, saying that the hair fall, breakage, perhaps there are other internal causes but she's neglecting the hypertension, the anemia, and hematuria that she has. Patients coming with allergy around their eyes, saying that I have an allergy, my skin is sensitive all the time. Every time I go expose myself to uh, the outdoors, my eyes puff up and they become red and very itchy. And so they believe this is an allergy. But they're neglecting the fact that every little by little, they're ignoring the upper shelves in the cupboards and they are tired when they're standing up. Patients would come in terrified that they have started vitiligo and they don't want to be labeled as patients with vitiligo. And so they get the salt and pepper rash, but they're failing to correlate it with the heartburn and preferring to eat soft food gradually and how their fingers are getting injured easily. So do they all present with skin manifestations? Well, in lupus, the skin is involved in 70 to 85%, and the presenting symptom usually is in 25%. The skin, of course, will carry a significant burden uh, in terms of psychological and psychosocial well-being and medical costs. The patients with cutaneous lupus have similar or worse emotional components of quality of life than patients with congestive heart failure and even diabetes. Whereas in dermatomyositis, for example, you will have 40% of skin disease being the sole manifestation at onset. And the muscle disease may occur concurrently, but may precede the skin disease, and it may follow it. Whereas in systemic sclerosis, Raynaud's phenomena and digital swelling can be the earliest presentation. And I believe psoriasis and psoriatic arthritis has consolidated the interface beautifully in the past decade. There were wonderful efforts between us together showing how we can join our forces and have a perfect uh, journey for our patients. And wouldn't it be nice to have such a graph for all our combined diseases? So how would it look like for lupus? Well, currently, I know as a dermatologist that when a patient comes with a rash, I know that lupus may have malar rash, but it can be reticulated, it can be mottled, it can be presenting as indurated uh, or bullous lesions. 
I know that they may present with vague signs such as vasculitis or just dryness. And I know that lupus can be acute, subacute, or chronic. And that discoid lupus erythematosus, although purely to the skin sometimes and only rarely like 5 to 10 percent, may present with systemic lupus, they actually need systemic therapy and management with my fellow rheumatologists. And so I also know that biopsy is important. As for the rheumatologists, when they are following up their lupus patients, so when you follow up your lupus patients, you know that they may develop a rash at any time during their disease. You know that photoprotection is important and that lupus pigmentation, scarring, and hair will affect the quality of life. And that's why you know you need a good collaboration with your fellow dermatologists. You know that lupus patients may ask about cosmetic procedures and you may not have an answer to this, but you have someone right next door to refer to. And so in this interface, we, we can order serology in both sides. We need to understand now with this collaboration that these assessment tools should contain cutaneous index, such as CLASI. We know now that FDA approved medications should include cutaneous lupus. And we need to know that there are best practices for cosmetic procedures. So cutaneous lupus, it can be it can be acute, it can be subacute, and it can be a scarring chronic disorder. It can also be bullous, such as bullous lupus erythematosus, and it can be associated with pemphigus foliaceus and pemphigus erythematosus. The photosensitivity is one of the ACR criteria. It's for UVA and UVB. And almost all patients of subacute cutaneous lupus are photosensitive, whereas systemic lupus can reach 60 to 70 percent of patients. Discoid lupus erythematosus, although not specifically a photosensitive disease, is actually in photodistributed areas. Lupus timidus is actually very photosensitive, and there may be a delay of the onset of the rash after the ultraviolet exposure, and that makes it difficult sometimes for patients to correlate these together. And definitely a physical sunscreen will be preferred in these patients. For lupus pigmentation, we know that acute lupus can actually be just as disfiguring as scarring, where the dispigmentation can result in depigmentation and hyperpigmentation together. Being on the face, this completely affects the patient's quality of life. We know that subacute cutaneous lupus can have this deep violaceous pigmentation that is very difficult to manage on topical treatments. And of course, the discoid lupus can be scarring, and that is irreversible, but may benefit from fractional CO2 lasers. In lupus, the hair can, can be in telogen effluvium phase, where there is just chronic hair loss, but it can have a special lupus hair as well. So hair loss may be noted in 85% of the patients, and it, many factors play a role in this, such as nutritional, physical, immune, psychological, and medications. But the lupus hair itself is very brittle, easy to break. And so sometimes even the products that we use for the patients need to be milder shampoos and silk pillows. So in the derma clinic, a biopsy and DIF is necessary to confirm the diagnosis, as well as correlation with serology. I will intervene for the exacerbating factors such as uh, applying sunscreen for these patients, and screening for triggers such as drugs like procainamide, minocycline, and hydralazine in systemic lupus, and antifungals and epileptics and PPIs in subacute cutaneous lupus. I will proceed with pharmacologic treatment, but I will contact my fellow rheumatologists so that we have a plan together. And I will continue to monitor progression to systemic lupus erythematosus, addressing the hair and pigmentary changes. And of course, where it's due, psychological support will be provided.
And so here is an example of the efforts of the collaboration between us together. And it resulted in CLASI, for example, which is an assessment tool where the cutaneous manifestations are important to address the uh, efficacy of medications in lupus erythematosus. And so for the process of management of lupus erythematosus, we will address the severity of the skin involvement. And if it's limited, we can stay on the topical treatments like steroids, topical calcineurin inhibitors, and intralesional injections, and continue this maintenance and monitor the patient. But if it's insufficient, we will start with the hydroxychloroquine, and we will have communication with the rheumatologist to continue together. And of course, when lupus uh, is refractory, we know all these new targets that are arising, that, uh, such as immunosuppressants and uh, biologics. And so for the treatment of refractory lupus, we can target the T cells or the B cells or the antigen presenting cells. And recently, anifrolumab, the anti-type uh, 1 interferon receptor inhibitor, has uh, been FDA approved for cutaneous lupus. So we are on our way to recognizing the skin manifestations in these patients. And in the pipeline for cutaneous lupus, we know that lifetilimab uh, is on phase three and CLASI is included in the, uh, uh, in the study. And as does Dilimab targets immunoglobulin-like transcript seven is in phase one and Bripocitinib, JAK1, TIC2, and uh, Ducravacitinib is TIC2. And as you can see in these studies, CLASI is included. What about dermatomyositis? So dermatomyositis rash is not a, just a heliotrope rash. Uh, Dictora, two minutes. How many? Two minutes. Targets can uh, trigger suspicion of carcinoma and the cutaneous dermatomyositis may be very stubborn and may persist for years. For rheumatologists, the rash is very pruritic, painful, and scaly. Scalp dermatitis may be the initial finding. It's very photosensitive, and the patients may ask about cosmetic procedures. So similarly, we know that assessment tools are important in the uh, approach to dermatomyositis and targeted therapies. So the rash of dermatomyositis can be Guttrin papules, the shawl sign, the heliotrope rash, or a rash on the face with puffiness of the eyes. It can be itchy uh, plaques on the knees, similar to eczema or psoriasis. And it can be the v-neck, and it can be a, initiate with only a scalp dermatitis. The term amyopathic dermatomyositis is one of the things that were validated due to the combined efforts where dermatomyositis only arises in the skin with no uh, myositis uh, up to six uh, months. And so the use of uh, immunosuppressive medications in this condition may actually help to prevent myositis in these patients. So in the derma clinic, biopsy is important to rule out differentials. Aggressive photoprotection is needed. Antipyritic agents may be important from topical to systemic. And topical corticosteroids and calcineurin inhibitors can be trialed as well as systemic medications for the recalcitrant patients. So for recalcitrant patients, we have the JAK inhibitors, the other immune suppressive medications, rituximab, as well as dapsone, apremilast, leflunamide, and thalidomide, and stem cell transplant. In the pipeline, we have Dazokibart, which is uh, also, so the assessment tool, CDASI, is in, included, and baricitinib in phase three. The calcinosis cutis, unfortunately, has unmet needs, and we need to further investigate how we can help patients with these conditions. And here's your example of CDASI, which is a validated assessment tool now. Systemic sclerosis, we know that patient's description of Raynaud's phenomena is not very specific, so we need to dig in the history. They may no notice the gradual tightening, but may also present with salt and pepper-like. 
And in the RUMA clinic, we know that cutaneous scleroderma may benefit from topicals and phototherapy, and patients will ask about hair loss, fissuring, and cosmetic procedures. So unfortunately, in systemic sclerosis, the severity indices are a bit limited. And just a reminder of the findings in systemic sclerosis and to highlight the salt and pepper, which can be an initial presentation. So we need to address the pruritus similar to dermatomyositis in these patients. And we need to address the telangiectasia, and we could use pulse dye laser. We have to address the calcinosis cutis, especially when it's infected or ulcerated with minocycline or other options such as methotrexate, infliximab, and rituximab. And in the pipeline, we have tocilizumab, anti-interleukin-6, showing response in the skin, and nintendanib, which is a tick inhibitor, as well as silotazole, which is a PD-3 inhibitor. Assessment tools are still not very rewarding. Oh, Doctor, please, the time. Okay. I give you uh, two extra minutes. Okay, so the jacne, uh, remember the side effects of the medications such as the acne, the herpes zoster, the pigmentation in hydroxychloroquine. So in conclusion, and thank you so much for the extra time, Room and Derm Interface highlights unmet needs in connective tissue diseases, and this collaboration is valid validating assessment tools in this profession. Specialized centers need to facilitate timely interaction between the two disciplines for recognition, appropriate management, and medication complications. Societies targeting connective tissue serve as a hub for this interface. And remember, I can have my derm team, and you can have your room team. But together, we will have a dream team. Thank you very much.